is Saha, the author of The Digital Choices, and you're listening to the Insurtech Story Podcast, the platform to spread knowledge on insurance innovation, digital disruptions, and entrepreneurship. Our website is insurtechstory.com, and we are available on Spotify, Apple, and Google. Welcome to today's show, where we will discuss on the topic, the influence of data in digital underwriting. And for now, I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Michael Robinson who is the Vice President for Insurance Transformation and Digital at GenPact for Europe. He works with a number of global carriers to transform their operations into digital and lean operating models that move to proactive insurance risk management instead of post-event loss compensation, making insurers a partner for risk. So welcome, Michael. Welcome on board. And I'm truly excited to have you for the show. Thanks very much for having me. It's really good to be here. Um, So, Michael, I would just like to start by saying um, underwriters have long been essential in traditional insurance contracts dating back to the 17th century Lloyds of London marine market. I think I guess that's where everything started. So underwriters, you know, were subject matter experts now and of course even then and had to supplement scar historical data with large amounts of personal intuitions and experience and over time more advanced techniques were adopted these techniques include for example probability curves accumulation limits and hazard rating these only represent decision support tools in many cases underwriters still applied large amounts of judgment into the art and the risk of selection process, particularly in large complex risk and special insurance. And this not only encompasses technical risk, but the commercial realities of the insurance market as well. So with this, let me move on um, to ask you, according to you, how insurer can best utilize its underwriting operation to leverage the benefit of big data for a better decision-making process. What would be your take on it? No, thanks very much. And I think you, you, you've hit something that's quite interesting where an underwriter is essentially someone who uses years of intuition and experience to gain a view on a risk in a market and determine the appropriateness of that risk. Uh, and whether they and how and whether they should actually underwrite it in the first place, and then if they should, at what price point they should they put it in. Now, historically, as you put it out in the seventeen and eighteen hundreds, um, a lot of this was based on experience um, and guesswork. I think is the best way to put it. Um, as we become more sophisticated over the years and gathered more data, a lot more data has become available for underwriters to use. The problem has been now is getting that data um, and understanding that data in a way that it supports the underwriting decision that an underwriter needs to make. Now, you have two problems with data. Because of the sheer volume that we have now of big data, it can become overwhelming for an underwriter to apply all the data. I think uh, it was put well where there can be too much information to make a decision. So you, you need to understand how much data is the right data and, and where do you need to pull that through? So big big changes in underwriting transformation have been centered on getting what we call the right data to the right point at the right time in the underwriting journey. So that, to, so that underwriters can make an informed decision based on where they are in that point of time. Now, digital transformation is one of the key enablers to get them that data. Um, a lot of Underwriters over the last 10 years have started employing underwriting assistants and spend hours, days trawling the web, making phone calls to to better understand a risk. And even then you can miss data uh, and having their team support them with that as well. So by, by putting in a digital transformation layer and enabling the access to the right data at the right time for the right purpose, you then empower underwriters to to effectively do the job they were hired to do, which is to look at the data and use an intuitive and experience-based understanding of market risk that they are the subject matter experts in to appropriately price and underwrite a risk for a carrier, rather than spending 70% of their time doing data research or market research on a client. No, absolutely. You know, um, uh, 
like from an underwriting perspective, adoption to the changing needs or rather the growing needs is also one of the key aspects that I guess uh, the entire underwriting fraternity uh, must look at with respect to the development of skills to thrive in the data and analytics age. And you, you rightly mentioned about the significance of data and the usage of data at the right time. So, you know, uh, according to you again, where do you think uh, data will play a major role in modern underwriting for from a digital context? You get my favorite answer here, which is it always depends. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think the, the best way to say it is you have to kind of contextualize it and say, well, what does that mean for a marine underwriter? What does it mean for an aero or a space or a commercial liability and DNO underwriter? Um, and... Uh, it, it is the million dollar question. I'm not trying to avoid your question. I think it's, it is the million dollar question. Um, and you need to, you need to spend a lot of time getting to know the intimate environment of what their world is. Um, particularly across industry and across marketplaces before you can really get that in. And I think that's where some of the, the changes I see with some firms out there where they have broad brush approaches. Um, doesn't make sense because you're trying to you're trying to fit a round peg in a square hole and and you need to really spend the time to understand where to go it in so it's it's not a direct answer but it's a sideways answer to to, to prove the point <laughs> no absolutely you know uh I, just on a lighter note um when we talk about underwriting and data itself you know it's inherently complex particularly mm. when we talk about the data mining techniques and so on and so forth how beneficial would that be for the underwriting part of the insurance value chain and you also mentioned about the marine uh, insurance part and as we know marine underwriting is one of the notoriously complex element in insurance and we have seen startups like insurewaves trying to you know make some difference there uh, th uh, how they're connecting through sensors and blockchain and big data to actually help uh, uh, ship owners and sailors and insurers to understand the way the ship is sailing and how the pricing would get, you know, auto calculated as per their movements. So, you know, just 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 a quick thought as you know, uh, just coming out of my curiosity, how do you see this marine market, you know, developing through this uh, emerging technology and uh, the big data stuff? It's an interesting one. And in, in my previous life, um, but prior to Gempact, I actually did a bit of work on the marine blockchain solution with one of the consulting firms that put it together. And it was it was born out of a very simple premise, which is how do we move the insurance industry away from an industry of compensation of loss to becoming a risk partner and, an, and a preventer of loss in the first place? And whether it's marine or aviation or property and casualty or, or liability, it, it all comes to the same thing. You need to be able to understand in real time where the risk is coming from, what is causing the risk, what is the impact of that event on what your underlying insurance or, or asset is, and is there anything you can do to stop it happening? So in the case of marine, um, including weather data, including wave flow data, including ship weight depth, including no-go geo zones, um, can, can go a long way to understanding how you can mitigate risk in real time. But what also can do when you start moving into the world of smart contracts and live pricing is you can, you can take remediative action in real time against behaviors or actions that, that might result in a loss. So for instance, if a, if a ship goes out in heavy seas uh, and your data sensors in real time pick it up that this has happened, you can have a clause in your contract that gets enabled that says, well, now that you're in heavy seas, um, we are going to cut cover because you know you're in heavy seas and you shouldn't have been out there, you, you went out against. And now that risk then puts all the loss on the ship owner or the captain to say, well, if I don't do something more sensible now uh, and go back to shore and something happens, I'm not covered for this event. Where previously it was quite hard to understand where the fault was coming through. So if you take that out, of marine into let's say property and casualty um you starting to see it in the retail market for instance with driver behavior and telematics you know rewarding good behavior rewarding 
driving sensibly with accelerometers and smart apps where it's designed to change the behavior to prevent the accident from happening in the first place. Now, as we all know, claims is the biggest um, division in a, in a carrier. You, you, most of your premium goes out in claims. So if you can start preventing claim and losses in the first place, not only do you keep your customers happier, but you also make your business more profitable uh, and you can invest in really creating it. So it is a win-win when you go across it. And that, as, as the whole point of this conversation is, is all about data, connected data and real-time data. Um, you know, Michael, you know, just, just moving a bit ahead of the aviation and the marine part that we spoke about, um, you know, we recently wit witnessed the uh, milestone achieved by Virgin Galactic, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I was just wondering, you know, just, just a bit of off the topic, uh, but however, I was just trying to, trying to relate how in such cases uh, insurers and underwriters will play a major role in space tourism? Do you know what? It's a great, it's a great question. And, and something we were debating the other day, where it was, I started off in, in, in covering what we knew. Uh, and there was a conversation that started in cyber and then weirdly enough moved into space travel. Um, and to give it context, if you look at cyber insurance, right. it's a really t tricky, tricky thing to insure because you know what you know and you can test for what you know but you don't know what you don't know. And, and you can recognize that there are what we call known knowns and known unknowns, and you can cater for those in a policy. But what you can't cater for is what's called an unknown unknown. You don't know what you don't know. And that becomes a very, very tricky thing to underwrite for, particularly when you start going into new risks. So cyber being new, but really new then is space travel. So you know you have certain risks of asteroids and mechanical failure and um, you know, a person being in space for an experienced amount of time, um, you know, claustrophobia or, or something like that. That can so you you know these. You you can cater for some unknowns, where you can create theories to say, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What's the likelihood of A, B, and C? And you can price that and bring it in and create data sets to do that. But where you get really tricky, and I think this is where the grey area of of space travel and space tourism from an underwriting perspective is going to get let's call it experiential, you're going to have to write the risks and see what happens, is the unknown unknowns. And that's only going to come out over time. And you see that in in um, aviation, where you, where you have these accidents that happen in aviation, where the planes are built really well, they're really well serviced, they're really well looked after, and something still goes wrong. Uh, and then there's this huge investigation to figure out what caused it. And that is an unknown unknown. So I think space brings up a lot of unknowns for us. It is the final frontier as it is, and, and we're going to have to see where we come to. But I think it's an exciting probability. It's an exciting possibility for the market. And I think it presents new opportunities for, for carriers to mitigate risk uh, and provide opportunities for cover. No, absolutely. I, I, I really look forward to the day when insurers from Earth will start insuring objects in Mars. <laughs> and I just want to see how it goes. <laughs> can can insure your holiday to Mars? Yes, that'd be yeah. lovely. How's your travel insurance? Where are you going? New York, London, or Mars? No, I'm going to Mars. Full travel insurance, please. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, you know, uh, Michael, just moving on to our next discussion points. You know, currently underwriters are working hard to select and price policies appropriately to maintain organizational profitability and remain competitive in the market. So in this scenario, how you see automation of the underwriting process getting into the mainstream of the insurance value chain? It's a great topic and, and something that I'm actively involved in at the moment across the market, which is how do we standardize, systemize and automate the underwriting process so that we take away the non-value add tasks and non-value add items for a, an underwriter and allow them to do the human element, the, the element that their skill set is enabled. Uh, and automation is a great tool to do that. Um, there, there's three things you need to look at when you do this. One is how do you standardize the underwriting process? So most underwriters today work on what we call swivel chair activities. You know, you're going in three or four different systems, you're opening pricing sheets, you're opening emails, you're on the web, you're phoning clients and brokers. Um, and that is a very disjointed, non-cohesive journey. So you need to create tools, and we, we use systems, what we call systems of engagement or workflow tools, 
where you create those handoffs or handshakes between systems that allow you to integrate and create a seamless journey for an underwriter to get through. Now, once you have that in place, you can start putting automation on top of it. So getting an email in, extracting the data, understanding it, pricing it, uh, looking for the web, scraping, look at the history of a client, you can start pre-populating all that data. So by the time an underwriter looks at a data, uh, a data, an asset submission, sorry, it's already ready to be looked at and underwritten. Now, that also can be loaded with business rules once you have it in there. So what is the target market business we're after? What matters to us? And you can create a triaging system and a business scoring system that says, give these types of business more priority over these types of business. And you can look backwards and say, looking at all our data in our data warehouse, how has business like this turned out for us from a profitability perspective? And you can allow that to then help select better underwriting and better business that you want to get through. Once you get to a journey for simplistic risks, and, and I'll, I will oversimplify it here with a mobile phone insurance example, but you're starting to see it with bigger, more complex specialty and commercial risks. You can, you can straight through automate that whole process from I have a mobile phone to here's your premium, set it up and take it. Uh, and, and you need that end-to-end -end system to do that in place. So what we see happening is, particularly in the next five years, at least 50% of commercial underwriters, um, not necessarily true complex specialty underwriters, but commercial underwriters tasks will be automated. Uh, and at least 50% of the risks will be straight through risks because it, it'll follow the business rules and the business metrics and the historical data. You will always have exceptions where a human will need to look at it, something uh, and you have it today, for instance, in some cases where you underwrite a mobile phone or a, or a vehicle where someone needs to look at it. But the exceptions will become very rare, not the norm. Uh, and that that is where I think you're going to start creating a lot more value for customers because you'll underwrite better, you'll underwrite quicker um, and your speed to market will be improved. And that will on its own allow more new types of business to be created because underwriters will be able to apply their minds to, well, where else can we underwrite? What else can I look at as a risk rather than spending all this time just processing data? True, true. I think you have just touched up on a very important part there. That's how you know, improving uh, how actually automation would improve underwriters' effectiveness as well as their efficiency by eliminating the non-core activities. So that that's something, you know, the industry, of course, they, they have started getting a foothold on it, but there's lots more uh, work to be done there. That's, uh, that's you know, I'll, I'll just add into that, that yeah. when, you, when you create these underwriting platforms, um, we expect to see an upliftment uh, in, in, in net underwritten premium. For, for a client. Uh, and typically we we aim for at least a 3% improvements in combined ratio, um, which for a large carrier can have a significant effect on the bottom line. Sure. So yeah. there are there are metrics that show that this works and, and that it is worth doing from a business perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, I think I think that's that's uh, one that's one of the major uh, measure for any insurers uh, you know towards their profitability mm -hmm. and bottom line. You know, and, and you know what, just one more thing to add there is it's, it's yep. being driven by historically low interest rates in the market. Most carriers used to make majority of their return from their asset management portfolios. The underwriting result was almost negligible. Uh, but with the asset management, and this is particularly true in the, the life insurance uh, space, um, where the asset management arm is just not generating the returns anymore. So you have to generate your returns from your underwriting result. And the only way you do that is by really understanding better what you're underwriting. And that's where you're going to now make your money going forward. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, Michael, the internet, you know, as we see, has rapidly become a normal part of life. And people are well equipped with the technology now, especially the millennials. Um, and today's customers want online platforms to be straightforward and transparent, and they shop for products that only meet their needs. So digital ecosystems and platforms are paving the path for direct sales in the insurance industry. So noting this, how do you see direct sales getting impacted by automated underwriting? I think something you have uh, just touched upon on how the... Uh, you know, underwriters must um, look at from a traditional aspect into a modern, uh, you know, improvements. Area. Uh, do, do you want a response more in the, you know, retail space or would you prefer something more in commercial and specialty market? Uh, 
I, I think you can touch upon on both if you l would like. Yeah, to. happy to do. So from a retail perspective, it creates a problem for consumers. Uh, and the example I use is if you were, if you had to go to court, would you Google for the cheapest lawyer? Or would you Google the best lawyer? Um, and most people, I think, would Google the best lawyer that they can afford, not the not the best lawyer that you know you can cost. So it comes down to two things. What are your needs and how much are you prepared to pay for those needs? Now, the problem with comparator sites or aggregation sites is over a long enough period of time, it effectively becomes a race to the bottom. Um, carriers want to be top of the pile, to be picked by clients who are just looking at insurance as a generic grudge purchase. Oh, I have to get motor insurance. I'll just get the cheapest. And inevitably what happens is you end up in a situation where the insurance you bought doesn't meet your expectations because you're not the expert. So again, it's it's almost like the point of representing yourself in a court of law. You're not the expert on law. You, you don't know this area. So people assume that the cheapest insurance policy will cover me for A, B, C, D, and E. I need to be realized that they shortchanged in the end. Now, digital straight through processing and, and this uh, digital ecosystem can have the negative effect of creating this value erosion in insurance. So you need to be careful as to how you present this for consumers and people. And this is where the ethics of the, well, the kind of the, the oversight comes in and, and you can use various tools such as artificial intelligence or machine learning parameters to bring it in. But the most common thing we're seeing is bringing in alternative data sources. So for instance, integrating to things like open banking, asking lifestyle questions, understanding more about a customer before you offer him a price so that you can ensure that you're actually giving them the right product that suits their needs not just a price to suit their pocket. Uh, and that requires a lot more thought around what we call the customer journey. What is the journey your customer takes to get to you? What is their lifestyle? And how do they end up with the product so that you're ensuring you're not just selling them an insurance policy, but they're actually solving them a, a solution through insurance to protect them and to protect what they need. Right. I, I think this is one of the... Uh supporting reasons where how uh, the technology platforms are actually becoming a direct uh, competition to the incumbents. So, you know, when we actually look at how direct sales would get impacted through digital channels and how smart contracts can also play a major role in it. So it, it's, it's giving a major boost to the tech, uh, you know, the technology players and how they're actually being a big business competitors for the incumbents insurers, both in life and general. Mm. So, uh, you know, just to speak on the smart contract parts, how do you um, see this, you know, shaping um, the direct sales with respect to underwriting? So you, you're going to have, particularly in retail underwriting, very, very few actual underwriters. They'll, they'll be more product coders. You know, they'll, they'll look at a product, they'll set it up, they'll work out the parameters, they'll load it into a system and, and let it run and they'll see the result. You're not going to have them looking at each individual case. They're going to be looking at it from a product perspective. And I think that automation will enable people to get better cover, uh, will enable people to get faster cover, uh, and also to get cover for things that traditionally wouldn't necessarily be able to to price because you don't necessarily have all of the data. However, it always comes with a warning uh, and people talk about you know, the Googles and the Microsofts moving into the insurance world. And what, what may be true is yes, they will move in from a technology perspective. They will create enablement platforms as in cloud platforms, technology platforms to get insurance to more places quicker. But one thing that is unlikely is they will not take on the role of capacity provider. Most of these insure techs and most of these full step digital startups get capacity from a traditional carrier, from a from a Munich Re or from a Chubb or from a Beasley. They, they provide capacity to these entities um, because it allows them to run them as almost mini MGAs. It's, it's an experiment with technology in an area that doesn't require me to flex my entire business model and my incumbent legacy stack to create a new market segment. And I can capitalize on a market segment at a really low cost uh, really effectively by doing this. So while the tech will be an enabler, I don't see them as being a threat to the incumbents, but rather another another weapon in their arsenal. 
you know, people talk about Amazon moving into insurance. Now, Amazon has a huge PE multiplier on their stock price. They use capital very effectively in a very lean model. Insurers are the opposite end of that spectrum. Insurers have to be very cash rich. You need a huge solvency ratio and a lot of liquidity. For a company like um, Amazon, it just doesn't fit the business model. So you'd rather come in with the tech play, keep your margin and your PE high, and let the capacity come from somebody else and maybe enter into a profit share. So it, it's an interesting, almost contradiction in the market where people say Microsoft will be doing my insurance or Amazon will be doing my insurance. The capacity, it might be fronted by them, but the capacity is going to come from traditional carriers enabled through technology. So it's, it's a complementary offering for me in the long term. So, yeah. Very true. Uh, ideally, what we're looking here is the faster processing time, you know, and the availability of the data gathered through, uh, uh, you know, the emerging techs um, would essentially enhance the underwriting statistics. And that would mm. lead to accurate decision making. And of course, hence a push towards the direct sales for insurance companies. Yeah, as you say, it'll be hands free decision making. You know, once you've got a large enough data set and a large enough representative sample, you, you hand it off and then your underwriter is not looking at each case, but rather looking at it a portfolio measure and tweaking some of the model, tweaking some of the algorithm as it goes in to run that straight through processing rather than underwriting each case because you've got enough data to do it and enough systems to do it. Absolutely. So, you know, overall, of course, um, uh, uh, looking at all the discussions we had, the future of underwriting after the technological integration if we can say in that way uh, has more to be explored and we would definitely look forward how the value chain will get uh, impacted both ways for, for the maximum benefit for streamlining this process um, so um thank you michael it was a fantastic discussion and thank you for sharing your thoughts there it was a truly light to have you as our guest no um, thank you very much i appreciate it always great to share with a with a learned audience absolutely um, and lastly, to wrap this up, thank you for listening and see you at our next episode. Take care and stay safe. Goodbye for now.